Thank you very much, Don. That was entirely too kind. But I have enjoyed getting to know a few of you folks over the past couple of days. I've enjoyed very much being in Bermuda. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to get to know you and to tell you a little bit about the company that I'm working for. It's an easy story. It's, it's fun to talk about. So let's get started here. I'm first going to show you basically our latest uh, commercial that shows some of the innovation with the aircraft. So yes, Honda is building a light jet, and they're doing it all in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I get to be a part of that team. But I'm going to give you a little background to start with before we get into the details of the jet and to tell you something about Honda, what's in its DNA to get to this point where it wants to be in the aviation industry. We've probably all had a Honda, owned one, touched one, generators. They have quite an array of products. It's, over, it's nearly a 70-year-old uh, company, almost $100 billion in revenue, nearly 200,000 people work for the company worldwide, almost 400 separate subsidiaries in 100 countries all over the world. So to put that in terms of airspace, uh, we often show another chart that I'm not going to show here, but we make more money than Boeing. So <laughs> that's how Honda can create, uh, or one of the pieces that they have a, a good financial backing to go into new products. How do we get to aviation? It really is sort of a natural progression of what Honda has done. They're into human mobility. They want to get people from point A to point B efficiently, safely, and uh, at a cost-effective price. Some of the products, we've got motorcycles, fuel-efficient cars, fuel cell cars. NXX is going to be a big thing coming out in June or July. Actually, they'll be at the conference I'm leaving for today. We're back into Formula One as well. So if you look at that and you think of human mobility, the natural progression is into aviation. We also have an obsession with speed. If you fo followed any of the Honda racing, and uh, we're hitting quite a high mark here at 483 miles per hour, which is our max cruise speed on the aircraft. And usually I stop there. But because we're talking about the DNA of innovation, I wanted to go a little bit more into what we call the Honda philosophy. And the founders, Mr. Honda and Fuji, Mr. Fujisawa, really set this up from the beginning. They didn't want to just make products. They wanted to create an environment where people can innovate for generations to come. So this was set up, the philosophy, from the beginning. It was formalized. You can actually go look up papers on it in 1956. And the core company pr principle here, I'm going to read it out, maintaining an international viewpoint, we are dedicated to supplying products of the highest efficiency yet at a reasonable price for worldwide customer satisfaction. So we're global. We're efficient, quality, and we want to be at a competitive price. Mr. Honda himself said, action without philosophy is a lethal weapon, and philosophy without action is worthless. So I think that's a great statement. Our foundation, and this sort of shows the foundation here, respect for the individual. So everyone has, it has value and has a good idea somewhere in there. We want to have joy in our work, so the joy of creating, selling, and buying, the three joys. And we have some guidelines that we use daily through our management principles. And this does sound a little bit cheesy, but when you, you read through them, I mean, it's, it's quite in, in impressive of what the in working environment that we have. Proceed always with ambition and usefulness. Respect sound theory. Develop fresh ideas and make the most effective use of time. Enjoy your work and always brighten your working atmosphere. Strive constantly for a harmonious flow of work and be ever mindful of the value of research and endeavor. Today, 
a lot of this is summed up in some of our marketing campaigns. You might hear power of dreams or the challenging spirit is sort of what sums up um, the philosophy. But what are the, the core, what are the action pieces that allows Honda to drive innovation? And I've taken a lot of time to try to read and understand this company that I'm working for. Yes, it's a cool product, but, but how did they really get there and what are the pieces that allow them to, to do that? One of them, continuous innovation. And I've got, probably a lot of you are familiar with the S-curve over here, talk about products, global economies, every, everything ebbs and flows, as they say. So we have inception, growth, maturity, and decline. So how do you stay ahead of that decline? And Mr. Honda, he was very, didn't want to be too slow to innovate. The paradox here is that in a lot of companies, just they're to get too caught up and they're still on the upslope, they're gaining sales. Why do I want to take resources and energy away from that to develop something else? So technology A, to get to technology B, before you decline, you've really got to be able to, will, to willingly put that energy and resources into something else while you still have a good market. You can think of companies that do well at this. Apple obviously comes to mind. Google, SpaceX is one of the other ones. Companies have not been able to continuously do this. I think of Radio Shack, that's one that's come up. Kodak, Polaroid, companies like that. They had a good idea, but they couldn't keep it going. Another piece of this is very um, institutionalized, is all of our R&D is autonomous. They, they are connected themselves, but they're not connected to any corporate objective. They have their own executive staff, their own budget, equipment, facilities, uh, venture capital. People are allowed to maximize their imagination and try to figure out that next uh, innovation to create demand and market space. We've got about two dozen um, R&D facilities globally. And it has a compounding effect. I think Paige hit it on a little bit. Is you just, if you throw out enough ideas, some of them are going to stick. And when you have more ideas than your competitors, more of them are going to stick. And so the next time, you're going to be able to have more ideas. And it's just going to compound on each other. We also have, when we do find that we want to take a product to market, we create a multidisciplinary development team. And it's always headed by engineering. And this has allowed me to understand more about my, how our company is structured because it is structured with the, the R&D, the gentleman that's in charge of it started out as R&D, and most of the, um, the J staff, as we call them, come from the R&D background. So R&D, engineering, manufacturing, cells, they're gonna all work together, and they're gonna work from what we call wall-to-wall -wall participation. So they're gonna not just, just get it off the ground, they're gonna stay with it through the launch of the product. So four to five years, you're gonna see the same setup after a launch into, uh, or entry into service, as we call it. Put some statistics into it. We were talking about it the other night in the aerospace industry. So Honda itself spends about six billion dollars. So if you saw the, the hundred billion there, it's about five to seven percent of their annual revenue in research and development. Six percent. Most aerospace companies spend one to two percent. We can talk about the defense and the government, how that's effective. They're very risk adverse. Um, but then the other statistic we read was Boeing, Lockheed Martin. Textron, which is Cessna, if some of you are not familiar with that, and Northrop Grumman, all four of those companies, their R&D dollars combined, multiply that times three, and you're barely scratching the surface of what Google is putting into aerospace. It's pretty amazing. And those I'm so excited to see companies like Google and SpaceX get involved, and even Amazon, because they're able to push the limit um, where some of these more legacy com companies just have not been able to, to get over the hurdles. 3D printing, we've got, I know, I think Cindy's speaking later, they're, they're already pushing that limit in the aerospace industry where I never thought I would be able to see something move so quickly in our uh, regulatory industry. I think hopefully this is going to work because this might show you sort of all the innovative products that we have been, not all the products, but nearly all of them. And this won the award, this is from Honda UK, an award um, won the advertisement. And it does not. That shows up pretty good. Let's see what curiosity can do. That's the word. You can get that off, so it's okay. So 
I love that one. It just really highlights all the things that Honda has done. And it won, I think, 2014 Best Advertisement of the Year. What do I got next? Now to tell our story, sort of Honda Aircraft, give you a little background there. How did we actually become where we are? So back in the late 20th century, Honda, of course, wanted to figure out the new products for the 21st century, and they put some think tanks together. And one of them was specifically for aviation. And they took these five young gentlemen, the one circled is now our CEO and uh, president, Mr. Fugino, and assigned them to go work on a project at Mississippi State, which I always just wanted, I would love to have been there that day to see five young Japanese gentlemen show up at Mississippi State. <laughs> uh, but they, they worked on two different projects specifically. Uh, firstly, they, they were working on composites, so they took this bonanza and they retrofitted some of the pieces with composites, and they want to understand the handling characteristics, how much lighter it weighed. And then they actually moved on to build an entirely co composite aircraft. So this is the first entirely composite business jet ever to fly, and it flew in 1993. It looks a little strange, but it's starting to show some similarity to the aircraft that we are building today. After that, they did come to the Triad region. There's a few other steps in there, but it was a very small secretive team in 2000, about 40 engineers, and uh, we've grown quite a bit since then. Why did we go to the Triad? I know there's some folks that are from here, so this is in the central part of North Carolina, and they want to go to the spot. You know, they're not, Honda's philosophy is not to manufacture and then export out. So most of business aviation is in the United States, 70 to 80%. Most of the wealth is along the East Coast, so they immediately knew we want to be on the East Coast. Piedmont Triad International Airport has maybe not quite as long a runway as here in Bermuda, I understand, that can land the space shuttle. <laughs> but it does have a very long runway and low traffic, so great for testing. And they had lots of um, availability for land, so we have access to the runway. Great business climate. I mean, the people are friendly. Um, they knew that they wanted to be in aviation. It's a very heavy textile area, as you guys know, and some of those have gone by the wayside, so they knew they wanted to invest in a business that could carry them into the future. As I said, super friendly. If you talk to Mr. Fugino, who he gave a, speak at one of the, a speech at one of the dinners to the community a few months ago, and he just had a good feeling. If you've ever been to the Carolinas, a lot of people get that good feeling of someplace you wanted to raise your family. A little timeline of how things happened. So after that 1993 flight, Mr. Fugino just, he likes to brainstorm. He has lots of ideas. So the story goes, in the middle of the night, he woke up with the, the idea for the configuration of the aircraft we see today and drew it on the back of a calendar, whatever was available. Because you know, you, when you have that dream, you might forget. And this is what that sort of looked like. He took that configuration. We went and did wind tunnel tests and, and tweaked it some until we came up with a finalized configuration. And then starting in 2000 and 2003, they actually built this aircraft at the Triad Airport, if anybody's familiar, it was part of Atlantic Aero, one of their hangars, and they did it all in secret. I like to say that they built it from Home Depot, and that's not too far from the truth. And it actually took off in Greensboro, North Carolina, in 2003, almost 100 years to the day from when the Wright brothers took off at Kitty Hawk, which I think is very cool. They wanted to take it and show it off to everybody, so we went to Oshkosh. How many people have been to Oshkosh? know what Oshkosh is. Yes, it is the biggest air show in the world. Even if you don't love airplanes as much as I do, I would highly recommend attending it. So we took it there. It got great response. Mr. Fujino went back to Japan and said, hey, we really think this could be a commercial product. They said, all right, we'll take it to the trade show. So we took it to MBAA, the National Business um, Aviation Association, 2006, and immediately had orders. So we've had well over 100 orders since 2006. So the board in Japan said, all right, this is a good idea. So we have a fully commercialized company now. Honda Aircraft is established. In 2008, we actually opened our first buildings, the headquarter and R&D on our campus. And now in 2010, December of 2010, we took off the first conforming aircraft. So a little different. This one is a prototype. The FAA doesn't care anything about it, but it made Honda feel like they had a product that they could use. The FAA cares about conforming. So that's what we've got going on there. We actually have four flight test articles, and there's a lot of the racing history you see in the color scheme. So they're very bright. Silver is F1, we call them. F2 is red. F3 is yellow. In that time frame, we finished our production facility. F4 is, is a little different shade of blue. 
We go back to Oshkosh, we're gonna go every year, regardless of whether we think that's the best market. They're, they have supported us and we're going to be there. Customer service building, so we have a fourth building there opened at the end of 2013. Several things happened at the very end of the 2013 with the regulatory authorities. The engine, and I'm not gonna to get too much into the engine, but the engine is actually built in Burlington. So right now they have all their um, type certifications. And so the end of 2000, they got type certified for that. We've got a repair certification, so you have to have that to have your customer service or MRO, maintenance, repair, and overhaul facility. And we also received our first TIA, type inspection airworthiness. So that basically gives the okay that FAA pilots can come start flying our plane. And they've been doing that, a lot of it. Our first production plane came off the line in June of last year. And a lot of people don't realize this. In the aircraft industry, you want to get that production line going because the moment you get the okay from the FAA, you want to be able to deliver aircraft because that's where you're going to make money. So we are making planes right now today. This one came off the line. It actually went around North America doing demo flights. I've got a little more information about that. But we do have dealers all over North America and Europe to sell our aircraft. And they went around 300 experiences, 60 different locations. Uh, so it, it got around a good bit. And we're starting an expansion on our facility. So we are growing, growing, growing. 2015, some highlights that have happened so far this year. In February, we received our flight simulator from Flight Safety International. Maybe some of you are familiar with Flight Safety International. They do uh, training. There's a couple of organizations that do flight training, and this is one of the big ones. They have an office on site with us. I had the pleasure of taking some of the beta class. So some of the employees at Honda Aircraft uh, took their initial training class. So I, I think I can fly it now. It was pretty easy. <laughs> F, uh, the engine, which is also a Honda product, project, or product, I have some more information on that, received its production certificate. So you get a type certificate, but you also have to get a production certificate, which means that you can build that product reliably, reliably and repeatedly. In March of 2000, just a few weeks ago, we received our provisional type certificate from the FAA. I mean, this is huge. This shows huge milestones as we're going on. Not all companies do this, but being that we're new at this, it was important for us to show big milestones. So the provisional type certificate that basically says we're, we're good with our design, we've got to tick off a few more things. We can also take our aircraft now and train some of our customers in the aircraft. So that's great. Right now, the most exciting thing, the plane is in Japan. So we took the second, line, the second aircraft off the line and we took off on Tuesday out of Greensboro and it landed in Japan as far as I know yesterday. So it is starting its world tour. We're obviously gonna to go to the, about 10 days in Japan and then we're also going to take it to the European trade show. This will be the first time we've been able to take an aircraft over to Europe. And there it'll do demo flights for our customers and potential customers in the cities all over Europe. So they're clocking 26,000 miles in 13 countries in the next uh, month or so. It's very exciting. Where we are with flight tests, we've got over 2,600 flight test hours. And this is always interesting to me, is we, do, we don't do this all in Greensboro. You go all over the, the United States to do flight tests, and most of it's pretty standard. You go to International Falls to do cold weather, you go to Yuma to do hot weather testing, you go to Roswell, New Mexico to do field performance, and all the companies do this. We do our more dangerous flight testing, flutter testing off the coast of Charleston. You have to go so far off the ocean. So we've been all over the United States testing our aircraft. And then, of course, if the weather's not great in Greensboro, we, got, we pick it up and go to Florida, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. We should receive type certificates, so we can officially deliver aircraft in the next few months. I see a date, but I can't tell you. <laughs> but it should be very soon. And then the other countries will follow. Obviously, the FAA is sort of the premier regulatory authority in aviation, and uh, the other countries just sort of follow up underneath that. Most of it's paperwork, not a lot of changes we have to make. I think that's the biggest update. So to give you a little snapshot of our campus that has grown tremendously, we've got almost 133 acres, uh, 600,000 square feet. These were the buildings that first opened, the production facility, customer service, and our expansion that we're adding about 75,000 75, more square feet of space, which we really need. I mean, I cannot tell you, we can't have meetings, Parking is a nightmare. <laughs> it's, it's, um, we're growing at a very fast rate, which is great. What do we do in these buildings? You might want to know. 
So over here in the R&D facility, right now we, it houses a lot of flight tests. So hopefully we, we want to transition to more serious R&D for the aviation industry. We do our structural tests. So there's two aircraft that will never fly that are considered conforming, and we try to break them. You probably maybe look on YouTube, you see some of that. It's, it's very interesting to see, but we do try to break the aircraft. We have an integrated test facility. It's somewhat like a simulator, but because everything is digital and electronic now, we can load up different software for the avionics in this facility before we have to go fly it, which is a safety factor and it saves money. Design Studio, we've got a nice setup where you can see you know, different layouts that we have. Um, we'll have sort of set patterns of what people can get, but of course you can get whatever you want on your aircraft. Headquarters, most of the engineering is there. I sit there as of now. Uh, delivery center, so there'll be a nice, I mean obviously when you receive an aircraft, probably much like a boat, it's a big deal and you want to share that with your customers. Flight test telemetry, so this is like mission control that's housed in our headquarter building. So the data off the airplane, two of the aircraft you see have a, a boom on the end of the nose and that, that's basically instrumentation to get, to get data from the aircraft and we can get that live out of this telemetry room. We have a mobile telemetry truck that goes to the other locations to get data. Simulators, they're here. Paint facility, you can tell we take a lot of pride in our paint. They've patented several different processes for paint. It's, it's difficult to make a yellow aircraft look not flat. It needs to look sparkling, and it's, it's fantastic to watch it. And we've got our main assembly, obviously. And the team, so we have grown. When I started in 2010, it was about 200 people. We're up to like 1,500 now very close to 1,500. And we've got everything, not just engineers, you've got your HR, you've got your facilities, IT, um, everything that you would need to support a commercial product. You can see how our team grows. We make a big deal when the planes take off and land, it's very important. And there's our first production aircraft. We're also creating quite a great culture. We've got over 40 nationalities. That's somewhat akin to the aerospace aviation industry. It's very global. We partner locally, that's a big deal, also not only to go to the spot to build our product, but to partner locally uh, at the spot we're at. So we have co-ops and internships, we're expanding that as fast as we can get mentors for them. And we're also uh, partnered with the Technical Community College to do customized training, and that's mainly for our entry-level assembly workers. And we've got clubs all over the place. We've got flying clubs, here we are at Kitty Hawk, motorcycle clubs. I mean, it's just it's a fabulous culture and a group of people uh, that I've gotten to know over the past five years. A little bit about the product itself, which is super fun, the Honda Jet. I mean, as everything we talked about, you, you learned about the company, Mr. Fujino really wanted to take everything to the next level. I mean, that's what we say when we say the world's most advanced light jet. It is really sort of the next norm, setting a new standard, performance, comfort, quality, and efficiency. This is simply a schematic of the aircraft, give you an idea of the size. It's about 40 feet long, and the wing stand's about 40 feet as well. Normally sit four people in there in a club-style seating in the cabin with a pilot and a co-pilot, or it's single pilot certified, so you can have one pilot and another passenger up there. That's important. Range, with four souls on board, we're actually, it's gone up to 1,200. We're pretty confident that we can do 1,200, which hits pretty much all of the East Coast. You can't go coast to coast, and it takes five days to get to Japan. <laughs> but but it's, a, it's a very useful aircraft. Flight level 430, that's another highlight, so we can get up and above some of the other air traffic and, and move around a good bit quicker. Innovation and inspiration. There are several pieces of the aircraft that look different, and I want to go into a little bit more detail on those. The first one, of course, is the over-the-wing engine mount. Probably haven't ever seen that before. There's a couple aircraft out there, but this one is going to be the most successful. It does two things, really. The first one that I think Mr. Fujino inspired him to do this is these small aircraft, you really want to maxi maximize that cabin space. And normally, the engines are mounted on the fuselage. So you have a huge carry-through structure that's limiting some of that space in the, in the aircraft itself. In a big commercial airplane, you hang the engines underneath the wing. We can't do that. We don't have the clearance on this aircraft. So put them on top of the wing. Now, obviously, you see a lot of issues maybe with drag and things like that, so it took a lot of time and a lot of patience and a lot of investment that I feel like other companies and, and other envir you know, com environments within the companies, they don't necessarily do. I mean, a lot of testing, computerized testing on, to figure out exactly the best location 
for the engine itself. And the pylon is actually an airfoil section, if any of you are familiar with those, but it, it's a um, tailored structure to have good flow between the fuselage and the pylon itself. It has a um, boat section on the end, so it's very aerodynamic. So that, that's one piece. We want to increase cabin volume. The other piece of this, which I use lots of fancy words, but basically there's a, there's a component of drag that's due to high speed as you get moving faster. This reduces that. So that's why we're able to go 420 knots, which is about 10% more than any of our competitors. You can also translate that into fuel efficiency. It reduces drag. Natural laminar flow, that's sort of a fancy word, but laminar versus turbulent, smooth versus rough. So if you want to keep everything smooth, you have less drag, which also maximizes your speed and um, allows you to have the best efficiency. He did two pieces that mainly focused on natural laminar flow, the nose section of the aircraft to make sure that that stayed very laminar, and then also the, the airfoil itself. So he patented an airfoil, which is, I mean, not many people do that. You go there and you look in the book and you go pick out one. He patented his own airfoil. High speed cruise, I mean, high cruise speed, docile stall characteristics, but still be thick enough to handle the fuel. Most of the fuel in an aircraft sits in the wings. We do have composites in the aircraft, but the entire aircraft is not composite. The fuselage is the main part that is. The rest of it is your um, traditional aluminum structure. And the unique part of this is that there's two different types of it. The main section here is what we call a stiffened panel or monocot. This nose portion to keep that laminar flow is honeycomb. So that we work with GKN to create, if anybody's familiar with GKN, they do our fuselage. We were able to create a frame structure so this, this together they can be cured at the same pressure. Normally you'd have to have probably four different pieces here and you'd have to cure them at separate pressures, but we're able to have two half moon sections all cured at one time and, that, and close them up together. So composites reduce your weight, obviously, but also it uses less parts than traditional manufacturing, which is a great cost saving. The engine, a little bit about it, I, I try not to focus too much on that, but yes, Honda powers most of its own products, and they developed the engine in Japan. They partnered 50-50 with GE to bring it to certification and production, which has been successful. The engine is now located and built in Burlington, North Carolina, which is right down the street from us. It's, of course, is designed to be very fuel efficient, low noise, um, well below any of the regulatory emission standards today, so it has room to grow. If you've ever heard this aircraft, you can hardly hear it. It's really, really quiet. It's fantastic. Of course, most of the jet engines has a, a digital or computerized control for the engine um, for best operation. Some cool pictures of the cabin. Of course, with anything, there's options, so we can add a uh, fifth side-facing seat, so you can have as many as seven people on board. About 12, uh, 12 inches more, a foot more, than our competitors between the seats there because, and we have a fully enclosed lavatory, all because the engines are now on the wing and we've been able to open up much, much of that space. The cockpit, I heard some people that were pilots around here, you might want to see this. We partnered with Garmin and we actually helped them develop their G3000, or 1000, and then this is the 3000, sort of the next generation. And the really cool part is that is all touch screen, like your iPad. So you just put in your waypoints, you change your radio, you check the weather. It's really, really easy. I was amazed at how easy it was when I took the class last week. Now, we talked about, I mean, several folks, I heard Honda talking about uh, uh, customer service, so we take great pride in that, our sales and service. We have locations, as I said, all over the United States, Canada and Mexico, and in Europe for dealers. So they'll be able to help us service and support our aircraft. They would be within 90 minutes of any one of our customers to be able to help them. And we're, we're gonna offer a tip to tail package We'll have flight ready, you'll have training, you'll have 24 seven call service. So we'll be able to get to you as quickly as possible. It's a big Honda, we have a lot to live up to with this aircraft based on the other Honda products that are out there. So our customer service is gonna be a key part in making us a success. And I've got one video left that shows sort of the progression about what we've been doing with the Honda aircraft. Honda jet, sorry.
Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>